Dr. Stone recently wrapped up its second season titled Stone Wars. Since I reviewed the first season back when it aired, I thought it would be fun to check in again and share my thoughts about how the show is progressing. Needless to say, I'm going to be giving you a lot of spoilers, so be warned. With that being said, let's dive right in. I want to first talk about the opening and ending themes for this season. I thought the opening was not quite as iconic as Good Morning World from season one, but this season was still a solid, pretty typical anime opening, and making the most of the beautiful background art we see throughout the show. The ending song, I didn't dislike it, but at the same time, I didn't think it was anything special. It was cool the way it showed Senku growing up surrounded by science, then being petrified and so on, but I thought the lack of contrast between the line art and the background made it a bit difficult to watch. Now that I've got that off my chest, let's talk about the actual show. Episode 1 starts with a summary of how the stone world came to be in the form of Gen telling a story to the children in the village while they work. It's a useful way to catch up the audience without distracting from the story. Then we pick up where we left off, preparing to take the fight to Sakasa by making instant ramen. I thought it was really cool to see the process behind something so simple that a lot of us take for granted. This is a running theme in the show, continuing from the previous season, and it was nice to have that back so quickly. We are also introduced to Senku and Gen's plan to convince some of Tsukasa's people that the US is up and running and on their way to rescue everyone in Japan. They want to use the voice of Lillian, from the record they found at the end of the last season, with Gen imitating her. It's an important character moment because it makes the stakes feel much higher than season 1 right off the bat, especially given that Senku and Gen want to protect the others from being caught up in doing something so deceptive. And when Chrome interrupts, we also see how serious he is about following Senku and saving everyone on Earth. This episode was a very strong opening in my opinion, really setting up the rest of the season. Following this, we see them put the plan into action, with the unlikely trio of Gen, Chrome, and Magma heading off to deliver a cell phone to their spies in Tsukasa's empire. However, with Homura on the delivery group's trail, we learn that she used to be a gymnast. They managed to capture her though, using some flashy science. Once the phone is set up, we get a really heartwarming reunion between Senku, Taiju, and Yuzura. Even if they're only connected by voice at this point, it's still adorable how happy they are to be in touch again. Unfortunately, the delivery team is attacked by a new character, Ukio. He has excellent hearing, which really throws a wrench in the works considering the deception plan is entirely sound-based. Gen and Magma get away from him, leaving Chrome in the enemy's clutches. Senku and Gen then work on convincing their first recruit from Tsukasa's empire, another new character called Nikki. It just so happens that she's a Lillian superfan who immediately questions the fake Lillian's identity. This is something that holds Dr. Stone back in my opinion. There's a lot of convenient coincidences that don't really have a good explanation in universe. It just so happens that the first person they try out this plan with knows Lillian well enough to see through the deception. The first person? Really? It feels a bit like some things are forced to make conflict happen rather than feeling like a natural plot of the story. I can more or less shrug it off because it doesn't stop the show from being enjoyable. At times, it just reminds me I'm watching something rather than being immersed in the universe. There were a few similar cases in the first season, but I think it was more obvious this time, just because of how much shorter and faster paced season two was. Regardless, they managed to convince Nikki to join them, on the basis that Senku will protect the last song for modern times. She also agrees to train Gen to be a better mimic of Lillian's voice. Again, I found this a bit unnecessary, since Ukiyo was set up to be the problem with this plan, and Nikki doesn't really play a big role at any other point in the story. I don't dislike her character though, and I am interested to see what she will bring to the table later on. Back in Tsukasa's camp, Chrome is imprisoned after Ukiyo unexpectedly lies to protect him from being killed. We get a cool little arc where Chrome uses his own science knowledge to escape from the prison. And for me, this was probably the best part of the season. It was fun to see Chrome apply the science he's learned with Senku all by himself, in a situation that could have been life or death. Even the trial and error before we got to the solution of making Bleach was great to see, but once again, it's pretty convenient that the battery was mysteriously handed to him. And since he wouldn't have escaped without it, I thought this was a bit of a letdown. It's not as much fun to watch a character succeed if the victory comes from something out of their own control, but I still enjoyed watching Chrome proving that he's grown as Senku's science apprentice. Meanwhile, the Kingdom of Science team has built a whole entire car. 
they show off their ability to make molds for large machine parts by sculpting beeswax. And when it all comes together, the vehicle is dubbed the Steam Gorilla. Of course, Kasaki gets pretty attached to the new member of the family, which is pretty funny. They want to use it to go and rescue Chrome. But since he escapes, once they arrive at their temporary camp, they decide to modify it. And by modify, I mean they literally turn it into a tank by making carbon fiber out of paper and just fully covering the car. Even for Senku, that's wild, but it turned out extremely cool. They want to use it in their final attack on Tsukasa's empire to gain control of the cave where the miracle fluid, aka bat poop water, is collected. However, as it turns out, Tsukasa has predicted this attack and sets up traps specifically to stop the vehicle. I'm putting this in the too convenient category since there's really no explanation for how Tsukasa would exactly predict the plan that Senku's group hadn't even finished. During this season, we do get a good portion of backstory for Tsukasa and how he worked to become the so-called strongest high schooler. But there's no part of his history that lets us know why he would have knowledge of battle strategy or to account for an incredible intelligence. Whereas for Senku, we know that he's just always been a super smart kid who studied really hard. Before the attack, Senku's team finishes up the voice mimic plan, which manages to convince a lot of Tsukasa's people to follow Senku. Ukio does interrupt them, but after speaking to Senku personally, he also agrees to help, on the condition that nobody gets killed. He saw Yuzara's secret mission, and it turns out that she was putting back together all the destroyed statues by hand, which Ukio was really impressed by. Since they were already going to try and finish the attack without harming anyone anyway, it's all good. Now, I don't want to sound like a broken record, but I felt it was almost anticlimactic that the person set up to be a problem for this plan ended up not causing much issue. But it was great to get more information about Ukio as a character, since he's actually a decent guy who was just pulled into a bad situation. When the team initiates the final attack, it's set up to be kind of dramatic with the whole speech about how the first 20 seconds of the battle are what matter. They fire a single missile from the tank, which is fake, but designed to scare the enemy. Also using sound cannons, they managed to finish up the battle in those precious 20 seconds. I felt like this was over too quickly, although it makes sense given the context. It just wasn't as satisfying as I would have liked, considering how much this fight was built up over the season. Following the noise of the battle and finding the hidden cell phone, Hyoga and the man himself, Tsukasa, appear to try and take back the Miracle Cave. Now that Senku and company have the nitric acid, they manage to pull together a concoction of nitroglycerin, which is the explosive that makes dynamite. With it, they force Tsukasa into a truce. The use of soap in this moment for the glycerin was a fantastic callback to the beginning of the show. Something I'm really impressed by throughout Dr. Stone is how consistent they are with these sorts of elements. This is the point that we get our Tsukasa backstory, and in the end, Senku says he wants to find Tsukasa's little sister, Mirai, so they can revive her. She had an illness of the brain, which the revival fluid heals as it wakes her up. After their beautiful, tearful reunion, Hyoga commits a top 10 anime betrayal by attacking the little girl. Tsukasa dives in in front of her and takes the hit, then gets pushed over a waterfall with Senku, and Hyoga jumps after them. It's more action in one scene than I feel like we've had for most of the season, and it's a lot to take in right at the end. But the fight the three of them have afterwards builds up to an emotional finale. Senku knocks out Hyoga by making a taser, which is honestly kind of badass for Senku. And seeing him work with Tsukasa after all this time of working against him is an incredibly cool moment. The season ends with Tsukasa's death, but the great part is that Senku builds a refrigerator to preserve him in a way that should allow them to revive him once they find a way to petrify people. So they're going to go looking for the source of the original petrification, which will take them overseas. It's an exciting and hopeful setup for the next season after the emotional roller coaster of the last couple of episodes. And the fact that the final episode is called Prologue, it does feel like the story is just beginning. So there's much more to come as the Kingdom of Science finally explores outside of Japan. Overall, I enjoyed this season a lot. It had so many great character moments, and I love that gentle sense of humor with that sense of positivity towards the future. Maybe to me, the plot felt a little rushed in places, but it ended up feeling more like a bridge towards the cast moving away from Japan into an even bigger story. So there's plenty I'm looking forward to in the next season and beyond. But what did you guys think of Stone Wars? Let me know in the comments. Although, I'll ask you to not give manga spoilers on behalf of the anime-only viewers. Thanks for watching, and come back soon for more anime content.